morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, ladies, for doing that. You know, again, like Pastor Josh said, this was a, a staple here at Bethel for many, many years. Our drama presentation, Bow the Knee. How many of you ever had an opportunity to see Bow the Knee? Let me see your hands, the majority of you, yeah. And we had a great time with it, as Pastor Josh said. If, you know, a number of years ago, we just felt like the Lord was telling us to, to move away from that. But where this is Palm Sunday, it's just been on my heart for a few months now. And I said, you know what, can we put that together? And they said that they would do it. So thank you so much. We're going to talk about the triumphant entry of Christ today in a very simple message that I've entitled Perfected Praise. And this has just been in my heart. And I just pray that I can articulate it in the way that the Lord has put it into my heart. Uh, I've said this recently a couple of times, but I just want to say it again. Kathy and I think very differently. That's not unusual for a couple. How many of you would say that you are different from your spouse? Let me just hear a good amen or, you know, some of you are afraid to say it because your spouse is right there. But the reality is opposites do attract. And so Kathy and I think very differently. Kathy is very strategic in her way of thinking. Um, she analyzes everything. Kathy, when she has a decision to make, a direction that she needs to take, um, when there is a problem that has to be solved, Kathy will analyze it, she will strategize and plan, and then she will execute. Because in her mind, achievement is the priority. We want to achieve this. We want to solve that. And that's how she thinks. Now, that is not the way that I'm wired. I don't think that way. Um, I, I am wired for the journey. That's just who I am. Destinations are important to me, but not necessarily uh, the most important thing to me. For me, the most important is the trip. Uh, the journey and what I experience along the way. I'm very relational in the way that I think and I enjoy the journey. I love the story that I will have at the end. I like the people that I meet on my path. I find their stories very fascinating. Kathy will tell you I can sit at a table with strangers and I will ask them very pointed, very intimate conversation or uh, questions, and I, I enjoy hearing their stories. And even if the story never comes back to me, as long as I can hear what other people have experienced, I'm okay with that. I love the journey. I like the unknown. I am the guy that doesn't need a destination in mind when I get in the car. I can just get in the car and go wherever it takes me. That's just the way that I approach my life. And again, I realize that I have to make decisions and there, there are deadlines to meet and I will do that, but always within the context of the journey. Now, the reason I'm sharing that with you today is because even though we are going to talk about the triumphant entry, we're going to take the scenic route here this morning, which is to say that we are going to arrive at Jerusalem by traveling through a psalm that was actually written 1,000 years before Jesus was even born. It's a psalm of David that at the time, probably no one would have even considered being messianic in its nature. But the triumphant day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, it would play a very significant role in identifying Christ for who he truly was, the eternal Son of God, veiled in flesh, now appearing. So I'm asking, with, asking you to come on this journey with me this morning, but I do believe that if you'll stay with me, it'll be very rewarding because I believe that along the way, we are going to discover not only the majesty of Jesus Christ and why he alone is worthy of our praise here this morning, but I also believe that we're going to gain some understanding of just how powerful sincere praise and worship can be in the life of the believer. I want you to understand something, and that is that in an age where a lot of Christians downplay 
the significance of worship and the significance of praise, that there is power in praise when it is lifted up from a godly heart in Jesus name much more than maybe what any of us could understand it's almost as if in the foolishness of simply praising God he does great works and great mighty exploits for his glory and honor and so my prayer is that as we work through this today that you'll come out recognizing that perhaps one of the the most overlooked weapons in your arsenal is praising the Lord through your storm. How many of you already know that there are few things that can bring God on the scene more than when you praise Him, even in the storm, in Jesus' mighty name? So our journey actually begins in the book of Psalms, as I mentioned, and this is a psalm written by David. It's Psalm 8. If you want to, you can turn there, because we're going to look at that entire psalm very quickly. But it's up on the screen for those of you that just want to sit back and take it in. It begins, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Now, this is a very interesting psalm because it ends just as it begins. It's with the same statement. Verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then in verse 9, the final verse, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So David, by bookending this psalm with the exact same declaration, is stating for us the purpose the aim, the goal of this psalm, and that, of course, is to reveal the majesty of his name, and a very specific name, which is given to us right here in verse 1 and verse 9, O Lord, our Lord. Now, I recognize that it sounds like the same word, and it's certainly spelled the same way, but there are two different Hebrew words that are there. And it's reflected in the fact that in many translations, that first Lord is in all caps. Because this is the proper name of the Lord. It is the name that God himself gave. It is the name Yahweh. It is the personal name of the God of Israel that comes to us from a statement made in Exodus 3 and verse 14 when God revealed himself to Moses as, I am that I am. It is Yahweh. A mispronunciation of it would be Jehovah, so don't be thrown by that. But the actual name that God gave himself was the I am that I am. God named himself Yahweh. That is to say, the absolutely existing one. The one who simply is. Who did not come into being and does not go out of being and never changes in his being because he is absolute being. He depends on nothing and no one for his being and all else depends upon him. Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. And I want to declare today that Yahweh's name is majestic. There is no one like our God. Can we talk about our God here this morning? There is no place on earth. There is no place under the earth. There is no place above the earth. There is no place in the heaven of the heavens where he is not Yahweh. He is the I am that I am. Everywhere, everything depends upon his sustaining word. Even today, believe it or not, you are being held together by the power of of Yahweh, the I am that I am. There is no one like him. There is no one but him. No one can stop him. You might be able to resist him, but you'll never be able to escape him. He is the almighty God, and one day every knee will bow, and every tongue will 
will confess that he is the great I am. And we came into this house to exalt that majestic name. It is sad how in the contemporary church you can come in to a church service and talk more about yourself than you can almighty God. But I came here today to lift up and exalt the name above all other names. He is Yahweh and he alone is worthy of our praise. Come on Bethel. Give him all the praise if you believe that today. There is no one like our God. Turn to your neighbor and tell him there's no one like our God. Yahweh, he says, is our Lord. Lord there is a derivative of Adonai. It is saying that Yahweh is our Lord. That he is our master. That he is our ruler. That he is our king. But what is interesting, watch this is that between verses 1 and 9, David is going to reveal the majesty of God and how God demonstrates his majesty. And he is going to demonstrate it in the most perplexing manner possible. It says in verse 2, Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. And you're left kind of scratching your head. Now listen, we live on the other side of the cross. We are 3,000 years removed from Psalm 8, roughly. And so we may not necessarily understand the perplexity of that, but I'm hoping that maybe for a moment you'll walk with me. They had no idea what this is really talking about. Because here we are just introduced to the majestic name of God, Yahweh, and we are told that his glory has been set above the heavens, and now we are taken back to earth, and not just to earth, but to men, and not just to men, but to babies and infants who are the weakest and the most helpless among all. Babies are cute, they melt our hearts, but let's be honest, babies have no knowledge, Babies have no wisdom. Babies have no strength. They are absolutely defenseless, and they are utterly dependent. So one has to ask themselves, where is David taking us? That he would introduce us to the majesty of God, but then immediately bring us back to babies and infants. Why are babies here, and what are they doing? Well, Thankfully, we don't have to ask that because we are told exactly what they are doing in our text. Out of their mouths, either in their babbling or in their crying, God's strength is being established to still the enemy and the avenger. Think about that. This is what David says. David says, God is going to display his majesty in that what is coming out of the mouth of a baby is strong enough to silence the enemy and the avenger. God is making whatever it is that is coming out of their mouths, and we're not told in Psalm 8 what it is. He just says that whatever it is coming out of their mouth is strong, and so strong, in fact, that God is using it to subdue his enemies and those that would seek to resist Almighty God. Now remember, David's not just pulling this out of a hat. David is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's being moved along by the Spirit of God and wants us to know that God is so great, God is so majestic, that there are times when he comes down to make babies the means of defeating his enemies for the glory of God. Now let that just sink down into your cerebral cortex there for just a moment. Because immediately you would say, well, why would he do that? I mean, we're talking about almighty God. We're talking about a God who could just think his enemy into destruction and it would be done. No one could resist him. But God is demonstrating something here and we cannot lose sight of it. He overcomes our enemy through the weaknesses of the weak. He wins with weakness so as to absolutely confuse the strong. God is establishing that he shows himself the strongest 
in our weaknesses for the glory and the honor of his name. Okay? He's establishing that. So can we go a little deeper here? Verse 3, he says this. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, and by the way, I don't think I need to say this, but you do all realize God doesn't have any fingers. God is a spirit, okay? So David is just simply using human language to help us understand God a little better. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. So here once again, the majesty of God is on full display as David tells us that it was with the fingers of God that the moon and the stars have been made and have been set in their places in their courses above. So when considering the great constellations that beautifully paint the evening sky, David looks up and he ponders it and he's puzzled and he asks, who is man in comparison to the great stars of the universe, the great galaxies that fill the universe, that you would actually be mindful of him, much less care for him? So as we did with the babies and the infants, we now ask, why do we show up? As, as David is unpacking the majesty of God, why is it that he brings us back to infants and now he brings it back to us? The answer is in verse 6. Look at it. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Now, obviously, he's taking us back to creation. When we were created in his image according to his likeness, what did God do? He gave us authority so that we would have dominion over his creation and that all things would be under our feet, that all things would be subject to us. Now that is amazing. God is sharing that with us. Man to God is like a baby to God. For all that we think we are, we think we're all that in a bag of chips, ultimately we are nothing compared to God. We are insignificant. We are powerless. We are defensive. You couldn't even have gotten out of bed today if God had not given you the strength to do it in Jesus' name. But just as God uses babies to subdue and defeat his enemies, God uses man to rule over and exert dominion over his creation. In fact, watch this. At verse number 5, he says, Yet you have made him, man, a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. So God not only defeats his enemies through the weakness of children, but he rules over the world through the weakness of men. And so God is establishing so clearly that even though he is majestic and his name has been set above the heavens, that he actually demonstrates his strength through human weakness, through babies, and even the frailties of men and women. And I'm going to tell you, that is a theme that runs throughout the entire word of Almighty God. It is why uh, Paul the Apostle said that I've learned to rejoice even in my weaknesses, because when I am weak, then he is strong. As I was thinking about it the other day, my mind immediately went over to um, Jonathan. Jonathan, as many of you know, was the son of King Saul, who was the first king in Israel. And there was a moment when King Saul took a very strategic place with his armor bearers, just the two of them. And there was an opportunity that, for them to strike a garrison of the Philistines, but it was just the two of them. And who are two against the garrison? And Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, 
For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Jonathan said, we can't miss this opportunity. And maybe the armor bearer said, there's only two of us. And he said, it doesn't matter. God cannot be stopped by men, whether it's by few or by many. He is able, because it's not how many are are in our army, it is how great our God is. And his strength is made made perfect in our weakness. In fact, if you go through the Old Testament, you'll find many times where God would thin out the number in the Israelite army because he wanted them to know it's not by might, it's not by power, but it is by my spirit that I bring the victory in Jesus' mighty name. Paul would actually carry that into the New Testament because when you come to 1 Corinthians and chapter number uh, 1 and verse number 25, this is a sobering verse, but it's powerful. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, Bethel. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to put to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring nothing to things that are. Why? So that no human being might boast in the presence of our living God Almighty. Mighty. If you ever thought that God used the weak, all you got to do is look around here today. Because I'm going to tell you, even though I love our congregation, not many of us were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many of us are powerful according to worldly standards. And certainly many of us were not born in a noble, influential family. God deliberately chose the foolish and the weak so that when we stand and do the works of God, no human being could take take any credit for it, but it would have to be given to Almighty God because there is no one like Him in Jesus' mighty name. So God is revealing His majesty in the weakness of man, and this was embodied in Jesus Christ. Because what is it that we know about His nature? Jesus is 100% God, but He is 100% man in the flesh dwelling among us. In other words, God's strength and his ultimate victory over all enemies would be magnified in human weakness. Because while he was here on this earth, Jesus operated as a man. Yes, he was God. And there were times when he demonstrated his divinity. But while he walked here, he walked as a man so as to put on display the great majesty of Yahweh for the glory and the honor of his great and holy name. He would magnify the the power of God in lowliness and servanthood. In fact, that's what Paul told us in Philippians, that Jesus, even though he was essentially God, he did not consider his equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself, emptied himself of all of those Uh, attributes that he owned as God so that he could become a servant to all so that in meekness and humility he would demonstrate the power of the living God Almighty and believe it or not that was reflected that day in the triumphant entry into Jerusalem and so now I'd like us to fast forward very quickly to Jerusalem that day As the story unfolds in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, many of you remember that Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead to arrange for a donkey that he could ride into Jerusalem on it. And why a donkey? Well, Matthew tells us. In Matthew 21, in verse number 4, it says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden, or uh, the baby of a donkey, one that had never been ridden before. Now, that was a prophetic word 
that was uttered some 300 years before Jesus was even born by the prophet Zechariah. And the prophecy is recorded, for those of you who want to follow up on this, in Zechariah 9 and verse number 9. Israel knew from this prophecy that one of the signs that this individual was the Messiah would be that he would triumphantly enter into Jerusalem one day riding on a donkey. So they knew that. So when Jesus chose to ride a donkey into Jerusalem on the busiest day in that city's, um, in that city's year, because this is Passover, by entering in on a donkey, he knew very clearly what he was declaring. I am the Messiah. I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For those that have heard that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah, you need to just look no further than the triumphant entry. Jesus knew exactly Exactly what Israel would be led to believe when he rode in that day on a donkey. He knew that he was declaring, I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. I am the King of Kings. And I am the Lord of Lords. And the people knew that because we're told in verse 8, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, which means salvation in the highest. Now, they are identifying him as the Messiah at that moment. Now, as we go through this, we're going to be introduced to three kinds of worshipers that you can find in any church gathering. That's kind of an internal thread. And so while we go through this, I'm going to point out those three kinds of worshipers. And prayerfully, you're not uh, one of the other two, but you're the right one, okay? The, the first one appears right here, and we're just going to call this first worshiper the restless worshiper. There are restless worshipers. Restless worshipers are those who worship the Lord so long as he does what they want him to do. As long as he answers their prayers the way that they want him to answer their prayers. But the moment that life goes sideways, their worship dries up as well. Because they're not really worshipers of God, they're worshipers of self. And that is the kind of worshiper that filled that city that day, for the most part. This crowd, worshiping Jesus, was worshiping him because he was their king, and they thought that he was immediately going to usher in the kingdom of God right there and right then. See, understand that to the Jewish mind 2,000 years ago, when Messiah came, there was no first coming and second coming, and that there would be this long gap between the two. In their mind, they thought when Messiah came, that he was immediately going to lead a revolution against the enemy, bring it down, establish the kingdom of God on earth, and would rule in the capital city of Jerusalem on the throne of his father David. And so when they welcomed Jesus that day, they said, salvation has finally come. God has answered our prayer. And they were full of worship. But when Jesus didn't do that, five days later, most of that same crowd was calling for his crucifixion. Isn't that sad? But I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of people that worship Jesus just like that. I've been pastoring long enough to tell you that there are people, they love to come in on Sunday morning and shout the praises of God when everything is working out the way they want it to be, when everything is lining up the way that they want it to line up, when God is answering the prayers that they want to, or when they come into a crisis, they're praising Him because they believe that if they praise Him long enough and loud enough that God will hear Him and do exactly what they want Him to do, but the moment that the wheels come off, off the cart and life goes sideways, they immediately begin to say, Jesus, who are you? You don't love me. I'm going to tell you that's the restless worshiper. And Jesus talked about him in Matthew 13 and verse 20, who hears the word and they immediately receive it with joy, yet they don't have any root in themselves. They never go deep in the Lord. 
They endure for a while, but when trials and tribulations and persecutions arise on account of the word, they immediately fall away. I pray you're not a restless worshiper because I want to tell you whether God answers our prayers the way we want Him to or not, He is still worthy of our praise. Folks, we need to get beyond ourselves and realize He is still Yahweh. He is still the I am that I am. And He's worthy of our praise. Come on, give Him praise if you believe that this morning. Okay, okay. So the next day, Jesus returned to Jerusalem and He entered the temple and He literally cleaned house. It was spring cleaning time. And it says in verse number 12 that He drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, a house where we meet with God, but you have turned it into a den of robbers and thieves. And the blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple, and he healed them all for the glory of his name. Now understand, this was the second cleansing of the temple. Jesus had cleansed the temple early in his ministry, and now as he comes to the conclusion of his ministry, he cleanses it once again. For years and years, temple worship had been suppressed, and it was held in the icy grip of religion. They they promised many great things to people, but they never led them into those things. Instead, they heaped heavy burdens upon them, but the priest would not lift a finger to help those that were oppressed. The sacrifices that were sold there were sold at extortionate prices. As they would travel in from many regions to offer sacrifices, many couldn't carry a sacrifice there. And so they had to buy it at the temple, and they sold it at extortionate prices. And even if you were able to afford your sacrifice When you got there, you would quickly find that those who were expecting the sacrifices had been paid off to find a problem with all of them so that you had to buy theirs anyway. It was nothing but a money-making scheme, and it was oppressive. And all the time this was going on, the suffering, the blind, the lame, the broken were there trying to find God, but they couldn't in such a religious system. But that day, Jesus cleansed the temple, and he healed the sick and set the captive free. And I want to declare that the same Jesus that was there in, 20, in, in 2,000 years ago is the same God that is here in 2024, He still saves, He still heals, He still delivers, He still sets the captive free, He is still powerful enough to get your kids off drugs, to restore a marriage, to heal your family. He is still a God who is able in Jesus' mighty name. And it grieves my heart of how in the United States we have turned church into a place of entertainment, into a place of business, into a place of celebrity pastors. And men and women are kept from meeting Almighty God. But I believe that the Bible is clear that in these last days, judgment is going to begin in the house of God. And the reason that many of these celebrity pastors are being exposed and churches are closing down is because He is being exalted so that all All men will be drawn unto Him and be set free by the power of the living God Almighty in this hour in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, give Him a shout of praise if you believe that. Hallelujah. Okay, okay, we've got to get going. Verse 15. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things He did. Now listen to this. Don't miss it. And the children... There's a connection. Maybe some of you have already made it. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children began to cry out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. These religious leaders, these religious worshipers, they were indignant. They were annoyed. That's what indignant means, annoyed. They said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Now, this would be the second kind of worshiper. This would be the religious worshiper. The religious worshiper has a form of godliness, but the power of God is denied. The religious worshiper loves coming to church on Sunday to give an appearance of righteousness. They're into the show, 
But there's no real hunger for the Lord. In fact, they get angry and annoyed when they hear real worship taking place. Like the religious worshipers would have just immediately got offended when you all got excited a moment because they think the church should be nice and dignified and quiet, pious. Because they like the show, but they have no intention of God changing their life. Jesus spoke of these religious worshipers in Matthew 15 and verse 8. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. These are men and women. Again, they'll say all the right things, but their heart is not right with Almighty God. Oh, please do not be a religious worshiper. Now, watch this. I'm going to move on. I could preach a long time on that, but we're going to go on. Verse 16, these said to him, these are the religious worshipers again. These religious leaders, do you hear what these are saying? What these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, I love that. Yes. And he doesn't go on to explain why he accepts it. He just says, yes, I've heard it. Have you never read, here it is, out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. He took them back. To Psalm 8. That's why we looked at it. Now these, before I break that down, these are the real worshipers. And what we're getting right here is a glimpse of what happens when worship is real, when it is authentic, when it is done in spirit and in truth. These religious leaders, these religious worshipers, they said to Jesus, listen to them. Do you hear what they're saying? They're calling you the son of David. That would make you the Messiah, the deliverer, the savior, the king of Israel. And Jesus just says, yes, and I approve of this message. He says, I am going to accept their praise. They're not blaspheming when they're praising me because I'm the one who has come to set them free. He said, these children are praising me right now. He says, listen, you're religious leaders. You're the pastors of this day. You know your Bibles. Doesn't any of this sound familiar to you? Does the weakness and the insignificance of children lifting up their voices remind you of anything? Do I have to remind you that in Psalm 8, he takes them back, that he said out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, listen, you have prepared praise. What he was saying to them is, this is the fulfillment of Psalm 8. What seemed for a time to be so obscure, so random, so hard to understand and decipher is now being fulfilled in your midst. Now notice, I don't know if you caught this, there is a slight difference between Psalm 8 and what Jesus quoted. I don't know if you noticed it. In the Psalm, it said, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength, but it never told us what came out of their mouths. It just said out of their mouths, there was established strength. But when Jesus quotes it back, I don't want to go deep on this, but Jesus is quoting out of the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. It's called the Septuagint. And when he does, he actually connects the dots. He fills in the gap, and we are told what was coming out of the mouths of children and babies and infants was praise to the magnificent God, to the Yahweh that David spoke of in Psalm 8, the creator of heaven and earth, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So when Jesus received the praise that day, he was declaring in no uncertain terms, I am Yahweh, I am that I am, and God is using the simplicity of praise to subdue his enemies and to still the avenger. And what was true then is true today, that God is still using the simplicity of praise and worship to silence an enemy that is raging against you today in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, can I hear a better amen than that? Listen, I know the world thinks it's foolish. But God says, I've used the foolishness of this world to confound the wise. That when we praise Him, walls come down. That when we praise Him, the enemy is silent for the glory and the honor of God. The 
world thinks it's foolish. That's all right. You know what I think is foolish? 70,000 grown men jammed into a stadium losing their mind because they don't know the outcome of a game. When I praise the Lord, I praise Him from a position of victory because He died, He rose again, He's coming again, and I praise Him because He's already overcome in Jesus' mighty name. When we praise Him, we silence the enemy. And I wish that someone would stand to their feet right now. And for about 10 seconds, would you lift Him up? Some perfected praise. And say, if God is for us, no one can be against us. In Jesus' name. Come on, magnify His name. Lift up your voice. He is Yahweh. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless your name. Bless your name. Listen, I am not foolish enough to believe that you can sing a problem away. You can't. But I can tell you, you can praise the Lord through your pain. And you can silence the enemy. Some of you have been listening to the lies of the enemy for way too long. What do I tell you? Praise Him. And God will silence your enemy. Come on. Bethel, magnify His name for a moment. Hallelujah, Lord, we bless your name, O Lord. The mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. King of your name, King of majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of great I am. I want you to be encouraged. Yes, it's a sobering moment, and we need to be brought into the cross. But I'm going to tell you, there's a reason that our cross is vacant. Because Jesus isn't on that cross anymore. He's not in the tomb. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And if He is for us, who can be against us? In Jesus' name.
Listen, if you're a guest here today, I hope I didn't scare you away. I, I yell not because I'm mad, but sometimes I just get really excited about our God. So I hope, I hope that doesn't offend you. And if it does, well, you can find one of those nice little quiet churches. But we're probably not going to be. Listen, listen. I, I, I debated because I don't want to draw this out, but I want to leave you this. Because lest anyone think that we're taking this too far. Many years after all this happened, there was an unknown author, possibly Paul, maybe another author, that wrote a letter called Hebrews. And as you could guess, he was writing to Jewish Christians who were wavering. Some were ready to fall away. And he wanted to tell them about the greatness of Christ again. And what did he say? Listen to this. In Hebrews 2, this should be up on the the screen. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 6, he says this. It has been testified somewhere. (laughs) Now, we know where it was. It was in Psalm 8. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, putting everything in subjection to him, that's Jesus, He left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see Jesus. We see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for every one of us. So he made clear that Jesus was the fulfillment of Psalm 8. You listen to me. We had our chance, if you will. In the garden, God gave us that dominion, but our sin caused us to lose that. But 2,000 years ago, the second Adam, Jesus, came and overcame the wicked one. And now all things are under his feet, and those who abide in him, it's under our feet as well. In Jesus' name. In Jesus. Never, never let go of Jesus. No matter how difficult life becomes, love him, honor him in all things, because he will never fail in Jesus' mighty name. Bless God. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this great day that you've given to us. And Father, as we bow in this place, if there is one here, that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I pray that today they would surrender to Christ because apart from you there is no hope in Jesus' name. For the rest of us, I pray that as we go throughout this week and we consider the death and the resurrection of Christ, that you would begin to just really prepare our heart for next Sunday. May we see a great number of people come into the kingdom of God in this hour. May your name be exalted in it all. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. Give him all the praise. Bless the Lord. Wow. You get a, you get a treat. You're getting out really early today, like really early. Listen, we'll see you on Friday night. Come. Going to be just probably a one-hour service or so. It's not long, but we want to just have communion together. We'll have a wonderful time. Be here at Easter. We're going to have a great time. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day in Jesus' name.